Come on, Cora. She's so excited. She is so excited to see you. She's like, hello. It's so odd. I had bought this case and it came out of Suburban, but the hub assembly was different. I'm, I'm assuming it was an all wheel drive. Yeah. But as far as the case goes, everything looks identical except for this rod has to go in that, that hole. hole. Okay. And all that does is your assembly rides up and down on that. It's, it doesn't have to be, you can see it's a little waller. Right. So it doesn't have to be. Super precision. I, the, the main thing with this is going to be holding it. Yeah. But I, I, but I, I, I think we can do it. Do or not. I can order another case if it don't work out. But I know we can't go very deep because these ain't very thick. So you want me to drill through it? You can if you want the fluid <laughs> to run out. <laughs> Seems like it's a good case. Yeah. It'd come out of a low mileage uh, suburban. So the problem is that you need this other hole opened up so this shaft will go in it. Yep. But this case was not machined for that because you believe that this was out of an all-wheel drive where yours is just a selectable four-wheel drive. That's, That's what I mean. you think. Yeah. All right. I mean, they got the boss know. there, so there's no reason why we can't uh, bore that out and I don't think make that, that work. That honestly, it'll be a problem as long as you don't get deep. See, somebody had been into my original case on my truck and when they took the back half off, yeah. you know, the little round tag that tells you what it is? Yeah, I didn't gone. didn't know what it was. Yeah. So I was just going well, you by could... what the internet would say it should have. Right. What year to make a model. And... Maybe the dealer would know? Maybe well, about... I figured, I figured it out. Okay. It's, just, it's an NP623. And I could have bought an NPX623. What's the difference? Well, fit. Oh. The splines are different. Huh. The NPX is in diesels. Okay. So the splines got a, are Yeah, a little heavier probably. So shaft is 620 thousandths, 5 thousandths under, under uh, 5 eighths. Got a good view here. Yeah, it's good nice out nice. there. That was a good idea, wasn't it? It was. I'm glad I thought of that. <laughs> yeah, the sliding glass doors uh, yeah, turned into good. nice windows. They make really nice windows, don't they? Yeah, so that's got enough slop in it to where intentional, so they when you put the case halves you together, got bit they a, got a little bit of wiggle room. Okay. And that's to set it on the gear assemblies. Yeah, and we've got a 5 8 reamer there that almost fits perfect. It's got a little bit of wiggle in it, but I'm pretty sure that that's, that's a, supposed to be a 5 8 hole. So this hole here needs opened up like this hole here. That's the, that's the deal. I'm gonna open up that other hole to five eighths. You want me to set it up on its end or something? Hmm. Would that help? I don't know. Like it's giving up, ain't it? It's giving up. There we go. They didn't make it easy to get out. I'm sure they probably make a puller for it, but they probably do. But the guy, like I say, the guy text transmission. He said we don't change him. Hmm. Well, you know, not a bad idea. Why it's out? It's not. It's still warm down in there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that torch does a good job. It does. She loves to chase uh, sticks and uh, chew on. Uh, anything all that's left on the floor? <laughs> you get sore. You get sore. You're rough. You're rough. You get sore. 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 Yeah. Boy, that's a big machine. It is, isn't it? Cool. I think it would sit there. 
Yeah, yeah. I just gotta uh, I mean, put, put some packing under here and then some clamps. It'll it'll work. And then we'll locate on that hole and drill it and ream it. I mean, you might want to set you something under here. Yeah. Huh? Oh, it'll work. It's going to work, Rick. Yeah, let's move it back that way a little bit. Yeah, that, that's fine right there. I know you probably got better things to be doing. No, no, I enjoy this kind of stuff, Rick. I don't mind helping you at all. Yeah. I just wasn't real comfortable. I, you know, we're just trying to do some real practice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that could go south real quick. Yeah, you could cause yourself a lot of problems on a drill press. I mean, it really, it needs clamped down and the hole yeah. needs put in, you know, in a good solid way. Oh, it's not going to fall. Once you put pressure on it, Yeah, they, they're, they lock together. What are those called? Step locks. I guess that's what they're called. I'm, I'm not 100% sure on the technical name, but they're they're just for. Yeah, that's what they are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can get them in. They're all different sizes. Like we're doing really small stuff, yeah. or bigger stuff, or really big stuff. And they just key together. They just key together. And they give you a, a parallel plane to press down against. Good idea. Jealous. Yeah. He's like, wait a minute, this is my shop. <laughs> what have you been doing? Study? No? Yeah. Uh, that handle? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're good, setup wise. Yeah. <laughs> <Whoa, whoa, whoa. laughs> that that fixed hand, that fixed handle right there, it'll work you over real good. They're like, <laughs> whoa, man, no thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect to give your bits a boxing. It is perfect height to just box your goods. <laughs> we was talking about this handle right here. If you're standing right here, because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it turns really fast when it gets that button. <laughs> it's about as good as it's going to be. Yeah, within a thou. It's close enough for what it is, isn't it? Yeah. Good enough. So hopefully this hole's not too big for this reamer just to cut on its or too small for this reamer to cut on its own. If it is, we will have to open it up in a little different manner. So but, it's clogged the bit up, right? Well, the reamer's only decided only supposed to remove a little bit of material. Um, it, it won't clog it up because I will plunge ream it but uh, technically you should go through one time with a reamer but uh, reamers are only designed to remove a certain amount of material but I think it should be fine on this one we'll see
so I elected to use a reamer for its long reach down in this case. And you know, you could have used a 5 8 inch mill. We just need a flat bottom, relatively flat bottom. The pin that goes in this hole has a pretty a large chamfer on the end, and this hole doesn't have to be exactly five eighths, so the ring actually works well. Just have it put out. Looking pretty good. Yeah. I remember to keep my head out of the way. Yeah. Now. Can't help it, I want to see. <laughs> yeah. We're removing a lot more material than this ring was happy removing, but it is working. Out. Yeah. This reamer is really made to remove a few thousandths, you know, 10, 15 thousandths. Right. Depending on the reamer. If this was steel, you wouldn't want to. No, do you wouldn't want to do that. It would, it would, it'd be too much. I think that's it, Rick. Yeah. Beautiful blue truck. <laughs> maybe next year you can use your truck. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah just take all the way off, yeah. It worked like a charm. Yeah, you can tell you tell what tell uh, uh, what's the name you did it with a file. Drill press. press. She used a round file. Yeah, just filed it out there. Yeah, it looks pretty good. I think that will work. So on the lay that turned down a diameter to fit inside of this shaft. We got to press this bearing in. It's got caged or needle bearings that are not caged inside of this and they'll fall out otherwise. And I want to be able to keep those bearings in place and get a good flat shoulder when we're driving the seal in. Couldn't do it in the press. This transfer case is just too too crazy shaped to, to get in the hydraulic press. So we're going to have to drive it in and I think that this is going to probably be about the best way. Something like that. Goo in there. I'm gonna have to make that smaller, I think. Eh. As long as it's straight. Eh, yeah, that'll work. Should work. That's it. I'm put this back in there to hold those needles in place. Let's look at the back side, make sure it's seated. Yep, looks good to me. Sweet.
Come on, girl. Come on, Cora. Let's go. So I've been asked by my brother, Joey, who happens to live way up north in Alaska, if I could help him come up with some parts for a tractor that his employer has. It's a small Japanese tractor from either the 70s or 80s, I'm not for sure. It was imported into the U.S. for a short period of time from what I gather, and replacement parts are just not available. I have called and looked and searched on the internet. I can't find anything uh, as far as direct replacement parts for this little for this little piece, and if I can't fix it, then pretty much it's out of luck. And that's a shame, because it is a pretty simple item, and I'll share it with you, the way that I'm gonna go about fixing this, because I don't know actually any other way to fix this than what I'm doing. So, in order to help my brother help his employer, I'm gonna try my best to make some replacement parts for this little, it's a little piece of junk, really, to be honest. But it works, and if we can get it back on the road and keep it on the road for a while, I think that's a good thing. So on the workbench here, you can see this is the original drag link. It's the linkage that goes, I believe, from the steering box to one of the knuckles, and then that steers the tractor, and it broke right here at the thread section where you adjust the length of this thing. So the problem with this is that just parts are not available. Like I mentioned, the original was ball joint was welded into this pipe section here so go to your parts store and ask for this from a tractor japanese tractor from the 80s that was imported for a short period of time as far as i can tell it's just not unobtainium so we got to make it and i've already got started you can see i've got uh, some of the parts here just a bent section of pipe two tie rod ends that are wrong size and uh, what we need to do and what we've been asked to do is repair the old one and make a new one so that's what we're gonna do. So we gotta make a new nut, and I'll explain why here in just a second. There's a lot going on here. And then we have to machine our taper on our ball joints so it's the same starting size as our original. Both of them are seven degree tapers, but these are bigger than the original. So to make them sure that they work, and I ship this to Alaska and it bolts right on, we gotta modify these tapers. So there's a lot going on. Let's get started. It's by simply making one of these large adjustable nuts. You know, I'll explain why as we're, as we're doing it. So before we get started with this, let me explain a little bit more what's going on here. So this is the part where it broke, this threaded section where this all threads together. One's a right hand, one's a left hand, and when you turn this nut, it adjusts the length of this tie rod uh, uh, section, whatever you want to call it. Now the problem is that this is 17 by 1.5 mil, which is pretty odd as far as the thread size. Usually you got 16 or 18 mil. 17's left out. Look on your thread charts and stuff. It's an it's a odd size thread. Now, I don't have a left-handed die to make this threaded section. I don't, just don't have it. I could order one, but it'll take several weeks to get here. Um, so I have to make a replacement, and I'll make it on on the lathe, except for I'm not going to turn this in a metric thread because I don't have the ability to turn metric threads on my lathe. I'm going to replace this with a 5 8 18 left-handed thread and make a new nut that is 17 by 1.5 right hand on one side. Got the, I've got the uh, tap for that. And then uh, 5 8 18 left hand on the other. So just doing the best I can with the tools that I have, and that's the way that I know to go about this. So, let's go over to the lathe, let's make a nut that is 17 by 1.5 right hand on one hand, or end, and then uh, 5 8 18 left hand on the other. So let me quickly give you the rundown on the order of operations here. First thing that I'm gonna do is come in here and face this big chunk. Then I'm gonna turn it, the major OD of this down to just slightly larger than the distance across the points of the original hex nut. This is a 26 millimeter hex 
26 mil or slightly over an inch, about 20 thousandths over an inch. So face it, turn the major OD down, then we'll flip it and we'll turn down a, a stub section here so we can do some work holding in a 5C collet on the lathe. Right now it's too big. So we'll turn it down to an inch and an eighth on this end. Then we'll machine our hex on it. Then we'll bring it back to the lathe. We'll bore it out and thread it on both ends. The reason I'm not going ahead and boring it while I've got it in the lathe right now is because I want to keep that material in there so this is rigid while it's hanging out there and I'm machining the flats on it. It's kind of the idea anyway. So let's blast the material off this and we'll go over to the mill and put our flats on this nut. So I've got my work flipped over and now all I'm doing is turning down a small nub for work holding in the mill down to an inch and an eighth so I can hold it in my USA 5C collet indexer. Now technically I wouldn't have had to turn down the major OD of this part because the act of milling the flats on this would remove all the stock. It just saved me a little, a little bit of mess uh, by, from chips in the milling machine, that's all. Oh man, those chips are blazing hot. Got a hole in my pant leg, or in my knee, in my jeans, and one shot down in there. The next burn up too. So to do our indexing, put our hex, or our flats on the nut, we're gonna use this little USA 5C indexer. I've already got it set up for, uh, for six, uh, six divisions. thing is nice. So for the operation that we're going to do, we don't even have to index this in. We just sit it on the table and literally that's good enough to, to get these flats on it. It doesn't have to be in line with the table at all. Just bolt it down.
So I'm all set up here, I believe. Got my end stop set. I'm going to trust this end stop and hopefully it shuts off before we chew into our, uh, our USA 5Z indexer. It should work. I did a couple couple test runs on it. You know, I haven't used it for precision stops since I've got this meal back together, so now is a good time, I guess. So we'll see together if it works. Now, we've got an inch and a half indexable insert end mill in here. That's what we're going to use so we can just make one pass instead of having to step over with a smaller end mill. Also, uh, we're going to try to do this in two go. We're going to go around twice, basically, because this is a lot of material to take off in one pass, and it probably get harmonic sticking out like that. So we'll touch off, pull off, I don't know, 50 thousandths or 60 thousandths, blast through, go around once, take a measurement, and then go down to our final 1.020 or 26 mil across the flats you know, on the second go around. So let's get this fired up and see if we can't you know, make it make it do its thing. So let's pull 50, see what that acts like. And that's one inch a minute. worked. Could speed up that spindle a little bit. Looks pretty good. So that was our first pass. See where we're at as far as across the flats. It is 1.123 inch. So we need to be at 1.020. So let's pull off uh, 51.5 thou feet up the knee. And that will give us the size that we need because we're working a diameter. So 51.5. Okay.
it. Looks good. pretty good. Any better finish than that on this would be just a waste of time. So there we go. A little closer look. Got a thou under maybe. It's fine. Looks good. Should have shimmied that saddle back and forth to get that radius out of the end of the cut there. It's the radius of the cutter left. I would have hit a square edge. Should still be long enough though. So in order to give this thing a nice finished look, we're going to get rid of those sharp corners, just chamfering this thing. We're just going to feed in until we just start touching the bottoms of the flats. Uh, just a hair more. So I'm going to spare you the entire process of drilling this thing out and tapping it. I had to drill one side, one size, and then the other side, another size, because I'm doing 17 by 1.5 uh, on one side and then 5 8 18 uh, on the other. It looks the same no matter what size or right hand or left hand thread that you're doing. But I had to do this by hand as far as the threading part, at least the left handed side, because this lathe doesn't doesn't run backwards and this was a big project considering it's, it's such a small part so we need to get on to the grinding of the seven degree tapers in the ball joint ends I thought that was a pretty interesting part of this I did the best that I could finding parts for this thing and sometimes you just gotta make what you can find work and that's that's what I did when it comes to this part She's laying on her little pillow, relaxing. So looking at these tie rod ends, they look pretty much the same. Now this is a tapered pin that slides down into a matching tapered socket. When you tighten the nut down, it pulls them all together and keeps it all tight. Well, the problem is that the original, you can see where it engaged in the knuckle, pretty short section there, about a half inch of engagement. It's right down on the bottom end of this taper. And this taper is 25 thousandths, the starting point of this taper is 25 thousandths smaller than the starting taper on this tie rod end. So I'm afraid that if I just put all this together and sent it, that this wouldn't slide down in that taper and engage maybe, maybe a quarter inch, maybe, which wouldn't be good. Now you could ream out the knuckles. They make a seven degree tapered reamer for, I guess, this uh, type of application, but I don't want to play that game. So what I'm going to do is chuck this up in my spin fixture in the grinder, reduce this taper down to the same starting diameter. The starting size of this one needs to be the same as the original. That way it works the first time. So let's go over to the grinder. I'll show you the setup. It's pretty simple, really. And, uh, We'll burn this down to the same size as this one, and it should work the first time. That's what I hope, anyway. So to resize the taper on this tie rod end, I've decided to use the axial and radial relief grinder. The reason for that is because it's already set up, basically. Spin fixture, set up parallel with the table, chuck in on the threads of this tie rod end in a 5C collet, and this is just set up to simply spin. That's all it's doing at the moment. I dress the wheel parallel with the table, and then twisted the head three and a half degrees. That way it grinds a compound seven degree angle. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bag this the way I don't get grinding grit and metal trash inside of this joint. Hold it, 
turn the spin fixture on, feed the wheel in until I grind down to the factory starting angle of the original tie rod ends, then we'll reset, and then I'll grind down once more just to get a longer matching taper. Uh, you'll see what I'm doing. It's a pain. I'm telling you, everything that I've done on that tie rod end has been a pain, but we're getting close to finished, and that's the main thing. So let me get all set up. I'll bring you in, and then we'll do the thing, make it work. The first one. go. 
Just grind it to that glue went away. And we got it, I think. There we go. I mean, I'm happy with that. So there's a look after grinding. Not too bad, not too bad. Finish could be a little better, on both of them. But it's not horrible. Happy with the way it turned out. I mean, I don't know what else to do. So there we go, both tapers ground. <sighs> Every which way I turn on this not so difficult project, it's becoming difficult or being difficult. If it's not the parts that are fighting me, it's the machines that are fighting me. Went to go cut the 5 8 left-handed, the 5 8 18 left-handed thread that I need on the lathe and my lathe won't start. It's got a single phase motor in it and some of you may remember years ago I rebuilt the uh, contact switch in the back of it. Well, now, a couple years later, it's finally gave up the ghost for the second time. I do have a new switch for it, but it's in the cabinet and I don't have time to put that in at the moment. There's a ladybug crawling across my desk. But anyway, I got to thinking, how am I gonna finish this project? I really would like to get this behind me. And I got to looking, and this has got a 5 8 18 left-handed thread on it that's just gonna get shoved up in here and then welded around the base. So what am I gonna do? Is cut this off in the saw and use that. It'll save me a little work as well. It's not needed. The original one's welded in, and I'm gonna do this one just the same. So there we go. That's the source of my 5 8 left-handed thread for this end. Then this stub will get welded in. Boom, boom, boom. Got the rest of the parts here. Done. Let's go cut this off. I'll show you that ladybug. Come on, ladybug. Flip over. There we go. Little ladybug. Oh. There you go. There we go. Did it, little girl? Look. See? Worked. What? Want more petting? Sometimes when you look at a job, on the face of it, it may seem like a simple 
repair project, but then once you get into the weeds, it gets a lot more difficult than what you originally anticipated, and that was definitely the case on this job. One would think that finding tie rod ends for a small tractor and making a pretty simple fabricated uh, drag link or whatever you want to call this would be easy, but I spent at least a good day searching for parts that just are not available for one call in even had some shipped to me that a man or that a tractor company said would probably work and then i had to ship those back ended up going to one of our local o'reilly's stores which happens to be a uh, parts warehouse and a friend of mine knew a guy there who took me in the back in the warehouse and we dug through tie rod ends till we found something that I thought was relatively close and even then they weren't right and you seen that I had to grind the tapers So there we go, all complete, and I can check that off the list, which is good, because this has been one of those pain in the you-know-what projects. Uh, trying to find ball joints or tie rod ends that would match the originals, coming up with the right and left-handed threads and making the nuts, just a pain. I'll be honest, two full days at least in this project, if you count my time searching for parts, because that is the easiest way, almost always, just to find replacements. But it wasn't just me, the owners of the equipment they they're pretty uh, uh, able to search for parts on their own and they couldn't find it tractor dealers that i called couldn't find it uh, my brother couldn't find it so pretty much all we was left with was making a replacement part and no matter what this replacement part costs if the rest of the tractor's good you know, it's still a good deal keeping that piece of equipment on the road because new tractors are not cheap and uh, if this will do keep them keep them happy then I'm I'm good with that it's what the owners want it's what the owners get so I helped two of my brothers out in this video my brother Rick and my brother Joey so my brother Rick with the transfer case and my brother Joey with this so I'm gonna box this up and get it on an airplane out to Alaska to where my brother can do the final fit and installation of this thing and it'll be complete so I guess that's it for this week anyway thanks for watching uh, viewers, patrons, subscribers, anybody who's helped me out whatsoever, it is much appreciated. So that's it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.